Now we're going to talk about the gastrointestinal system, or the GI tract. In this presentation, we'll go over the process of digestion. We'll look at the various organs involved in the digestive process, some of the enzymes and hormones that are involved in regulating digestion. And after the food has been broken down into its component parts and worked its way through our villi and microvilli, stay tuned. We'll talk about absorption, transportation, utilization, and excretion. In class, we will continue our journey through the digestive system by looking at a movie and then looking at actually more details on specific nutrients. Okay, let's go. Oh, actually, before we get going, I just want to go over some stuff that I get every semester that students ask about the food in the cafeteria. First, let me say to you that there are no laxatives in cafeteria food. It is prohibited. It is obscene. It doesn't happen. What I hear from students is that when they eat in the cafeteria, they have to go to the bathroom right away. The food runs right through them. Unless you're really, really sick, you have some serious parasite that's causing your digestive system to dump fluids into your gut, you're not excreting what you just ate. So let's have a look at this timeline. The time that the food takes to leave your mouth or the time that it is actually in your mouth is usually less than a minute. So it depends on how fast you chew. It spends about one to two hours in your stomach, about seven to eight hours in your small intestine, and about 12 to 14 hours in your large intestine or colon. So what is, how shall we say this delicately, what is coming out of you as you run to the bathroom after you ate breakfast is not what just went into you. And we'll talk more about that and please be sure to ask because it's a topic I'd much rather discuss face to face than over a screencast. What is digestion? Digestion is the breaking down of food. It's taking big food parts into smaller food parts. This is what's referred to as mechanical digestion. Mechanical digestion involves muscles and nerves and it takes that food that you get in the cafeteria or wherever you are eating and breaks it down in physically into smaller and smaller pieces. This involves various muscles and nerves. And we also have what's called chemical digestion. And this is what breaks down large nutrients like polysaccharides, long chain amino acids, triglycerides into smaller and smaller ones. This involves acid in your stomach, the enzymes, and hormones. Basically what's going on is that you have this food tube that runs from your mouth out the other end of your body and the food goes through it and during this process it's broken down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces and as it moves through the various organs it then gets absorbed from the small intestine. It has to get broken down so that it's small enough that it can get absorbed through the cell walls into the bloodstream or the lymphatic system. So we have chemical digestion and we have mechanical digestion. What is an enzyme? What are these enzymes that are involved in mechanical, oops, I mean chemical digestion? Enzymes are proteins that catalyze or speed up metabolic reactions and they're necessary for most of the biochemical reactions that go on in, their in our body. Digestive enzymes specifically break down food substances we have amylase that breaks down carbohydrate, protease, which breaks down proteins, and yes, you guessed it, lipases that break down lipids or fats. What is a hormone? A hormone is a chemical that's produced by cells in one part of the body, and these chemicals are secreted and then affect the behavior of cells at distant sites in the body. If we say this, for example, might be a cell in the pancreas, and this is insulin, Insulin is produced by these cells in the pancreas and it travels, let's say this is traveling to a distant site, let's say this is a site in the brain where it will act on the receptors on the brain to help it take up glucose. We'll talk more about that when we talk about diabetes. But for now, 
the hormones that we talk about in the digestive process are cholecystokinin and secretin. And the journey begins with the mouth. We have two types of digestion occurring in the mouth. We have chemical digestion or the actual physical act of chewing, aka mastication. And we also have chemical digestion. In the mouth we have secretions that include saliva that has water in it, a lot of water, and the enzyme amylase. In particular, the amylase in the mouth is referred to as salivary amylase, and this enzyme works specifically on breaking down carbohydrates. In the mouth, the food that you had for breakfast after chewing becomes what is called a bolus. Then this bolus crosses over the epiglottis and goes down the food tube, also known as the esophagus. This is where peristalsis begins. Peristalsis is muscular wave-like actions that occur throughout the entire digestive tract. Peristalsis is controlled by our central nervous system and it allows excretion by propelling foodstuffs through the body. So as I was saying earlier, when you race to the bathroom after you've eaten breakfast, what's happening is that the food that you put in your mouth stimulated the peristaltic process and whatever was in your large intestine is now being facilitated to be excreted, to use the words that are so elegantly placed on the slide. We have here our peristaltic waves moving food down the food tube and we also have segmentation. As food moves down this food tube, it gets broken into smaller and smaller pieces. And we'll talk about this word chyme in just a second when we get to the next slide. So we have segmentation and we have peristalsis that break down and push food through the digestive system. The stomach is a muscular organ and storage reservoir. It's about the size of your fist, although when you eat, and if you eat a lot, it does expand to accommodate. It mechanically digests food by mixing and churning, so this is mechanical or physical digestion, and it chemically digests food with the acid, one of the secretions that's found in the stomach, as well as some enzymes, the major enzyme being pepsin, probably the only enzyme we'll talk about that doesn't end in ASE, and pepsin works on digesting protein. Here, the bolus becomes what's called chyme, or what I like to refer to as a semi-liquid mass of partially digested food. Over here on the right is a cross-section of the intestine, where the chyme goes to after it leaves the stomach. The chyme crosses over what's called the pyloric sphincter and moves into the small intestine. This is where digestion is completed and absorption occurs. If you go over here on the left, we look at this picture. So the food moves from the stomach here. It was mixed and churned, crosses over a valve known as the pyloric sphincter and moves into the small intestine. Your small intestine is covered with what are called villi and microvilli. Oops, but first let me tell you that the small intestine is divided into three sections. The upper section is the duodenum, the middle section is the jejunum, and the lower section is the ileum. And your small intestine is covered with these tiny villi and microvilli, these folds that increase the surface area across which nutrients can be absorbed. So we're kind of looking at one of the bazillion villi and these folds are microvilli. An individual one is called a villus. These are the cells that line the villi and so your nutrients, let's say we're talking about carbohydrates that are broken down into individual monosaccharide units they will cross over this wall, these cell walls, and move into the bloodstream. Fat is processed differently and is absorbed into this yellow, which is the lymphatic system. Signaling the accessory organs. Why do we have accessory organs? They aid in the digestion of food. How do they work? They work by 
messages given to them by the hormones that are produced in our digestive system. The cells of the intestinal wall produce the hormones cholecystokinin and secretin, but they enter the blood and they signal the accessory organs. What are the accessory organs? Your accessory organs are the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. The liver makes bile, the gallbladder stores bile, and the pancreas makes enzymes for the chemical digestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. It also makes sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the stomach acid. Let's talk a bit about the function of bile. I mentioned in class that bile acts as an emulsifier. It takes big blobs and breaks them into smaller blobs. So let's look at this representation of your stomach contents. What you eat breaks down into fat and water, and they tend to separate. These red discs are the enzymes, and they cannot attach themselves to the fat because it's too large. What bile does is it acts as an emulsifier. It has an affinity for both fat and water, and it breaks down this large layer of fat into smaller layers of fat. The enzymes that are present in the stomach, in the fluids of the stomach, can now get around the fat and begin to digest it. Once these contents are broken down into their, their tiniest parts, they have to move from inside the cells of the intestine into the circulatory system, either the bloodstream or the lymph. There are different mechanisms by which this absorption occurs. We have what's called passive or simple diffusion, in which nutrients like water, glycerol, and small chain fatty acids simply move across the membrane into the bloodstream. Facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport in which nutrients like water-soluble vitamins diffuse across the membrane using a carrier or transport protein. And then we have active transport where nutrients like glucose and amino acids move across the membranes against a concentration gradient and because they're moving against a gradient, they need energy, or ATP. What I ask you to know is that there are three different types of absorption, and these are passive diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. Nutrients are absorbed all along the small intestine. In the duodenum and the jejunum, many, many nutrients are absorbed. The lower part of the small intestine, the ileum, only certain nutrients are absorbed. In the colon, there is absorption of water. Once these nutrients have been absorbed, the water-soluble nutrients will travel in the blood vessels to the cells, and the fat-soluble nutrients will travel into the lymphatic system. That which does not get digested and absorbed gets excreted, and the contents move from the small intestine across what's called the ileocecal valve into the large intestine which is also known as the colon. So it's the ileocecal valve that connects the small intestine to the large intestine. The appendix is an organ that's also part of the large intestine. As the contents move through the large intestine, water gets reabsorbed. What's finally left moves into the rectum and gets excreted through the anus. In class, we're going to watch a movie about the digestive process. It's a little graphic at parts, so be prepared. And then we'll continue our journey through the GI tract, focusing on specific nutrients. Thanks.